Welcome back to Doctor in Forensics. Well, it popped in my feed last week from the Houston Business Journal that uh, Joel Osteen's Lakewood Church received $4.4 million in COVID-19 PPP loans. Well, I don't know how you all feel about that. It doesn't sit well with me that a church that on a weekly basis that could fit up to 52,000 congregants would actually have a money problem. I don't necessarily think it's a money problem. I think it's a greed problem. They certainly have some resources someplace. I'm pretty sure they have a bank account. But this article just leads me into something deeper. It makes me stop and think, does the Lord even like the church that he sees here in the West? I don't think he cares for it at all. So grab your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 2 as we study the seven letters that Jesus wrote to his church. And we're going to see if we can answer the question, does God even like the Western church? In just a second. Make not my father's house an house of merchandise. Now, I'm not going to take time to read the article. It's actually a waste of time, but I will read a clip. And it says, multimillionaire televangelist Joe Osteen's Lakewood Church in Texas netted $4.4 million in bailouts through the federal COVID-19 relief program record show. The Houston Mega Church, the largest in the nation with 52,000 weekly congregants, received the forgivable Paycheck Protection Program loan in late July as the Houston Business Journal reported on this past Sunday. The loan was the third highest in Houston area during all of July and August, the outlet noted citing federal data. So some would say, what's the problem with the church receiving a PPP loan? Well, let's be honest, they're not a church. They're a business. In fact, because of their 501c3 status, if they wanted to give you an individual money out their pocket, they couldn't if they wanted to. So as I was saying earlier, this article leads me to think about the book of Revelation, in particular the first four chapters where Jesus wrote seven letters to seven churches, of which none of us seem to adhere to because we have such abysmal behavior. And note I said none of us. It would We would do well to listen very carefully to the words of Jesus, which is why I said in the monologue, I don't believe God even likes the Western church. The early apostles were given instructions to leave behind as to what a church should look like, how a church should govern, what a church should do, and how a church should be discipling. And here in 2020, we look nothing like the first church, let alone do we even stop to think about following the carefully written instructions by the early apostles and the disciples so that we can actually have healthy churches. We look nothing like, we act nothing like, I don't think God likes the Western church. If I ask some of my family members and friends if they like their church, they always tell me yes, but they always tell me yes for the wrong reasons. They like the pastor. He's funny. The people are nice. They love youth night. They love the men's, the men's breakfast and the women's fellowship, but they can never talk about the consistent biblical teaching and them actually growing. In fact, they'll leave a service on a Sunday morning and they can't even tell me what the preacher preached about. Oh, I forgot. They don't preach. They give sermons about how you can have your best life now. Because keep in mind, they're really not churches. They're just businesses. 
To those of you who don't know, Jesus actually wrote seven letters to the churches in the book of Revelation as transcribed by John the Apostle. And in these letter, he actually indicts based upon what he saw are the behavior patterns that are suspect that was causing the churches of that day problems. What's interesting is that this is a parallel vision to the same problems that are causing us issues in today's church. It will be well for us to know exactly what Jesus is talking about so that we can escape the judgment that will come from not listening to his words. In Revelation 2 verse 2, the Lord is talking to the church at Ephesus and he says, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and that you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary verse four but i have this against you that you have left your first love therefore remember where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else i am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent one of the most egregious things that i have ever been taught and is completely heretical was that Jesus has forgiven us of our sins, past, present, and future. Now, the blood of Jesus does forgive all sins, but the blood of Jesus only forgives the sins that we actually confess. So as a believer, if you're taught that your sins in the future are already forgiven, the enemy uses that as a ploy and you become completely lax, and therefore you don't take sin serious. Now that's up for debate and many people are going to fight me tooth and nail on what you have been taught because I was taught the same thing. It's just that what we've been taught has been completely incorrect. Jesus is admonishing the church at Ephesus to repent, which means they must have been following him for quite a while. And that means repentance needs to be a part of our daily and weekly and monthly and annual Christian walk. It's an ongoing process. We can all find something that we have done that needs to be completely repented of. And repentance is a large part of the walk of a believer that leads us into a life of holiness. In Revelation 2, 8, Jesus writes his letter to the church at Smyrna. And he says, the first and the last who was dead and who has come to life says this. So Jesus identifies, hey, I'm the one writing this letter to you. He says to them, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the blasphemy by those who they say are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. What a stark contrast between the church at Ephesus and the church at Smyrna. Jesus actually tells the church at Smyrna that he knew of their tribulation and their poverty, but he also said that they were rich. They were rich in the truth of the word of God and that he understood and knew who were the ones, particularly the Jews that were blaspheming. He also went on to say that they could expect to be persecuted and that they would suffer, but they are just to endure the test and the tribulation. He told them to be faithful unto death and that if they did so, he would give them a crown of life. We could all hope to be as faithful as the church at Smyrna. A message to the church at Pergamum. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way 
hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Now in this passage, Revelation seems to link Balaam with the Nicolaitans, so one can assume the church at Pergamum and Ephesus faced a similar dilemma. They were immersed in pagan Roman culture in that city. Now the sect of the Nicolaitans may have attempted to woo the Christians away from their religion, or should I say their belief, just as they had been wooed before. Now the Nicolaitans also appeared to eat food that were offered to idols, which Acts appears to decree against in Acts 15.29. Now although this one doesn't seem like a major offense, in their context they had committed a serious spiritual crime. Verse 16, therefore repent or else I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. That language is used elsewhere as we read in the book of Revelation when Jesus returns at the battle of Armageddon, he destroys his enemy with the sword of his mouth. Verse 17, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, to him I will give some hidden manna and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Now, what does this have to do with today's church? Actually, everything. Balaam was a source of error and wickedness, and he sabotaged the Israelites as they entered the promised land. He told King Balak how to get the Israelites to commit sin by enticing them with sexual immorality and food sacrifice to idols. Now Balaam was a non-Israelite prophet in the Old Testament as cited in Numbers 22 through 24 as a diviner who is importuned by Balak, the king of Moab, to place a maldiction on the people of Israel who were camped on the plains of Moab. In other words, he was somebody who purportedly was a man of God but yet he couldn't be trusted. Pretty much that's everybody on Christian television. Let's continue. Now to the message to the church at Thyatira and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like burnished bronze says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your deeds of late are greater than the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray, so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idol. I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Now, if you've been around for some time, you've heard a message on the Jezebel spirit. And I'm going to break down the Jezebel spirit into just one word. That word is rebellion. Now, we know that the spirit was associated with Jezebel, but it's actually genderless. Uh, sexuality or has nothing to do with it. God is saying here that it was a prophetess someone who leads and teaches servants astray. Anyone who leads and misteaches the children of God, they basically are in possession or being manipulated by a Jezebel spirit. But the Lord says something interesting. He says that he gave her time to repent. So yes, he's saying the word her, but who or what is he talking about? Well, in today's society, he's talking about those ministries that have gone aside after money, those ministries that are steeped into narcissism and the celebrity of the pastorate and the celebrity of those who are called the prophetic and those celebrities of people who we esteem to be those that are apostolic and way workers of quote unquote miracles. But God is not happy with them. He says this, verse 22, Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. When you go back and read the book of Kings, you can see 
exactly what it was that Jezebel did, how wicked and dastardly and manipulative this uh, woman actually was, who was some possessor of this spirit. And that will tell you all. Verse 22. And I will kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Ah, here's where it gets tough for all of us. God is not looking at a corporate punishment here. Punishment for behavior like the spirit of Jezebel will fall on all of us individual, individually. Verse 24 who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. So God lets some off the hook because they know nothing about this because they're following in the ways and the precepts of the Lord. Verse 25, nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. That means hang on saints to the truth. Let's not be persuaded or dissuaded by all the false teaching. And then Jesus gives a great promise. He who overcomes and who keeps my deeds until the end to him, I will give authority over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod and iron of iron as the vessel of the potter are broken into pieces as I also have received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Before I move on here, I'm going to focus back on verse 20 so you will understand why Jesus hates the spirit that was in Jezebel so much. It reads, but I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel. He's talking about that spirit who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bond servants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. When you go back to the book of Kings, you'll actually get a good idea of just how wicked this woman Jezebel was and what the spirit in her motivated her to do. She actually instituted Baal worship and actually built a temple of Baal for her weak willed husband in Samaria. Now, Jezebel, she was a strong personality, strong willed woman. She was also very smart, but she was terribly wicked. And sinister. She actually had Naboth killed when he refused to sell his vineyard to her husband, Ahab. But this spirit and everything about this spirit has infested the culture of God's church and is the true enemy of God's true prophets. Well, you say, who are God's true prophets? Individuals that actually will hold up and put the word of God before the lies that we're hearing across TV and social media. Those people who uphold the word of God are true prophets. All of the nutcases that are telling you that they have a word from the Lord, or they're spending time making videos, giving all of these prophetic updates. Do not believe those people. They are not prophets of God. They're liars. To the church at Sardis, to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds that you have a name and that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep to it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments and I will not erase his name from the book of life and I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The message that Jesus shared to the church at Sardis for me is a very sobering one. Verse 5 in chapter 3 of Revelation says it all. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garment. And I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. 
Why that becomes so startling for me is because in the Western church, we have so many who actually teach once saved, always saved. Not a proponent of once saved, always saved, because it doesn't line up with the scripture. Jesus clearly says that we have to overcome. In verse 2, he says for us to wake up and strengthen the things that are remaining. Verse 3, he says that we have to remember and to keep everything that we were told. And the operative word of everything that Jesus is saying here is that we must repent. The last two letters, I'm going to read them straight too, so that it will help you see the stark contrast of what we're experiencing in today's church. It's real clear to see that God is dividing the sheep from the goat the wheat from the tear. And as we read both of these letters straight through, you have to decide on whose side you want to be on. Both of these messages to the church at Philadelphia and to the church at Latta Lucia has in time right now implications that has to do with our behavior and the decisions that we're making to be on God's side or not to be on his side at all. Revelation chapter 3 verse 7 and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write he who is holy who is true who has the key of David who opens and no one shut and who shuts and no one opens says this I know your deeds behold I have put before you an open door which no one can shut because you have little power and have kept my word and have not denied my name behold I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie I will make them to come and bow down at your feet and make them to know that I have loved you because you have kept the word of my perseverance I also will keep you from the hour of testing that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth I am coming quickly Hold fast to what you have so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. The message to the church at Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you might see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne. And I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So if you hung in there with us through this teaching as we covered the seven letters of Jesus, I hope you walk away with the same thing I'm walking away with. I need to be completely dialed in to what Jesus is saying and not being distracted by the things that the world would say are important. Seven times Jesus called his true church to overcome. I think it will be a great exercise if we stopped and prayed along with the Holy Spirit and asked the Lord to give us the strength for the year ahead to overcome everything that we're faced against. The world, the flesh, Satan, and all the other attacks of the enemy. 
at the end of it all, we don't want to be found guilty of not completing the race. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers. Incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, denying the power thereof, from such turn away. I find it very interesting that the Apostle Paul was concerned about being disqualified. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Let's keep reading 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, and they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Verse 5, Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as an example for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and to drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, up of whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stand take heed that he does not fall. No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful who would not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Well, I'm going to leave it right there. If anyone was going to ask me my opinion and thoughts about 2021, 
I would suggest they do what we just did. Read through the seven letters that Jesus wrote and left for us to understand. I would also suggest that they read the words that Paul left and how he told us to avoid all of the mistakes of Israel. And when we do that, all will be well with us. I want to thank everybody for listening to Doctrine Forensics in 2020. It's been a great ride with many of you commenting, sharing, and contributing. I want to thank you because, one, I know that I'm talking to true believers of the Most High God. And I'm so honored that you all follow the channel. And thank you for contributing and thank you for your prayers. And I look forward to seeing you when the King of Kings brings his kingdom to the earth. God bless you and your families.